Hello to all the rugby league diehards and welcome to another episode of Six to Go. My name is Tom Canfell and it's great to have your company. As we head into today's episode, you know how it works. We will cover six topics related to the game or even their own career. My guest this week is Josh Hannay. Josh is the Queensland assistant coach and after what I believe was the best game of rugby league ever, I had to get him back on to discuss how it all unfolded from his perspective. Hope you enjoy our chat. Here's Josh Hannay. I'm joined by Queensland and Cronulla assistant coach Josh Hannay as the next guest of the 6TO podcast. Josh, congratulations on the series win and thanks for your time as always. How do you feel? No, yeah, no thanks for having me. Um, obviously, yeah, still on cloud nine um, after the, the, the game and performance on Wednesday night. I think, um, you know, for me personally, uh, 20 years involved at the highest level as a player and coach, it's the most, um, probably the most memorable and, and enjoyable night of football I've ever uh, yeah, had the good fortune of being involved with. Immensely proud, mate, to have been a part of that and to be there and to be able to soak up uh, the performance, but also the reaction of the crowd and the atmosphere. It was it was a really special night, mate. Well, mate, it's a pleasure to have you on, and I'll get things kick-started with the week prior to Game 3. Cameron Munster and Murray Tulungi are positive for COVID and out of the game. It would be a natural reaction... I would think to be a bit deflated if you lose someone of the ability of Cameron Munster. Can I ask how the group morale was at the time? Yeah, that probably 24 hour period, that was Friday um, afternoon when that news came through. It was an interesting time. There was a a day off for us. So we're all sort of doing our own uh, thing. Um, Some players, staff are catching up with families, other are playing golf. So we're all, kind of out and about doing our own thing. And when that message came through on the, on the group chat that Cameron had tested positive, it was def- deflating is probably a decent way to to put it. I, I, I remember I was with my family and I, I was trying to enjoy catching up with my family. But when that news came through, I just couldn't, I couldn't really think about anything else apart from the news and, and, I, and I guess the implications of the news and, 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 and potentially what that meant to our, our our chances of winning. So it was a it was a difficult day and then Murray Tualangi tested positive and um as a coaching group, myself and Bill, um we were actually sitting there talking about team selections and our, our options in terms of how to replace Cameron Munster and obviously Tom Dearden and Ben Hunt were the two obvious. And while we were going through that, the call came through that Murray Tualangi was now positive. So our focus went from team selections to concern about our oh, how how far is this going to escalate? Are we going to lose more and more players over the next 24 hours? So it was a really difficult, um, as I say, 12 to 24 hour period. But once the next day came around and, and everyone else had tested negative the following morning, we trained that 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 morning. And and I've got to say, the players just got on with business. We um, we had a really good session. We integrated Tom Dearden into the group. Uh, into the sixth jersey um, it, it, seamlessly. Um, and I think the fact that he'd been in and around the group the entire series as sort of an 18th man, he he fully understood um, what we were trying to do and how we play and how we defend. And he wasn't a stranger to, um, I guess, the group at all. And that and that really helped his, his integration into, into, the, into the starting team. So, as I say, the, the, the 24-hour period where we were thinking about worst-case scenarios was challenging. But once once we knew we were all clear in terms of anyone else being infected, we were really able to get on with life and, and, and get into some really good preparation. Did you know that day that did and would start at six? Um, we, it, it was our first choice. We, we certainly, as I say, training was going to be a, a huge indicator for us as to I guess our confidence levels in in terms of that being the right choice. So, yeah, he that that, that next day on the Saturday, um, he trained at six um, for the bulk of that session, and you know came off the training field, and we we're all happy with how it looked, and, the, and importantly, the players were really confident in in how it felt. So basically, after that training session on Saturday, we all settled on Tommy. Yeah. Just on the two guys that came in as replacement, Dearden and Oates, gee, they were good, Josh, particularly in effort areas like kick chase. I thought they were both tremendous. Yeah, they were. They were. And we knew we'd get that from both those guys. Um, Tom, um, in his short, I guess, career to this date, one of the hallmarks of him is his tenacious sort of style of play, whether that's with the football defensively, uh, kicking game, chasing kicks, uh, effort areas. Like We knew that wasn't going to be an issue. Um 
And then with Corey, obviously a bigger body of work. He's, he's been around the game a long time and we really clear and confident on what he brought, brings to the table and what he would uh, bring to, to the table for us. So, you know, there was a bit of discussion there. We had Hemiso in the squad and you know, obviously Hemiso's an outside back, but we just felt like Corey was the right option, um, playing good at club level, bigger body, physical. Um, and I thought he played uh, exactly how we um, thought he would play. He was tough. Uh, he was safe. He was, he, was, he was a cool, calm head out there on the big stage. And, and I think the way we played and the way both those two guys played, um, yeah, we, ultimately I thought we pulled the right strings in, in those selection choices, yeah. Let's get into the game, Josh. Is this the most brutal first 10 minutes you've ever seen? And what was it like sitting with the other members of the coaching staff, watching players, frankly, dropping like flies? Yeah, it is the most brutal opening to a game I've seen. It was it was a throwback to a, 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 an origin game of the early 80s. It was it was no holds barred. It was it was on for young and old and 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 we you know, we knew we needed to start with the right intent. Um we thought we got beat to the punch in game two, um, pardon the pun, and um, we certainly didn't go out there with any intention to, to, to start any melees, but I think, you know, we, we, we had our guys wound up, there's no doubt about that. We, we wanted to start well, bring the crowd into the, into the contest and, and make it as hostile an environment for our opposition as we possibly could. And, and I guess one of the things that um, the byproducts of that is it can bubble over and, um, and, it, and it did at times. And as I say, we don't condone, um, you know, fighting and punching. It, it's not what we coach. It's not what we encourage. And it's not a great look. But it's also, as I say, it, it's it's almost expected when you have guys wound up the way they were. And um, I, I just thought a physical start to the game was what we needed after game two uh, to put game two to bed, to let everyone know we'd moved on. I thought the opening to the game was critical for us to to basically put a line in the sand and say, we're a different footy team tonight. We're coming after New South Wales. And I thought, I thought we were, uh, we're really able to do that. God, it must be valuable having Kurt Capewell in the team. He, he, I think he spent more time at centre in this series than back row. Yeah, it's a luxury. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, I see it here at Cronulla as well when we've got a guy like uh, Sifatelikai who plays anywhere from centre to back row to front row. And in this day and age, um, the versatility of your football team is is paramount. And, and to have individuals in your team who can uh, cover multiple positions, it's a luxury. And, and certainly Capes is, uh, was a luxury for us. And his ability to play... Uh, as well as he does at any in any position that he's put in is a is a great strength of his and um, yeah certainly given the circumstances of Wednesday night his his versatility was really important for us. Queensland scored first through a beautiful piece of ball playing from Tom Dearden, but after that, Josh, I'm not sure if you felt the same, but in my opinion, New South Wales were really starting to get on top after they scored. Tedesco was really starting to punch holes wherever he popped up. How important was it to you that they scored on the stroke of half time to make it back to a two point game? Yeah, that try before half time was was really important. I think um, coincidence or not, you look back at the series. Um, each game there was a try scored on the stroke of half time, and the team who scored uh, that try went on to win that game. We scored on the stroke of half time in in game one. The Blues did in game two, and then we did in, again in game three. And it's a critical period in any game. It's a period where um, if you can be the team that does that, you, you go into the sheds feeling like you've wrestled momentum. And I'd have to agree. I thought probably the, the from about the 20 minute mark to the 30, 35 minute mark, they were they were they were winning the the, the contest. Um, you know, not necessarily on the scoreboard, but they were they were the team looking most likely. So to get that try, you know, potentially against the run of play, you could say I think. Just was a little bit of a gut punch to the to the Blues and, and a and a and a good little confidence boost for us going into the sheds to, to only be two points down. What were you seeing from a coaching perspective that allowed New South Wales to have a real dominant twenty minutes in there and in that first half and how was it fixed? Yeah, I think um, one of the things the opening of our game to the game was it was taxing. Right, we we invested so much 
uh, physical and mental energy into the into the start of the game. And I, and I think once that sort of opening wore off and then we just got into the grind of the game, the transitional nature of the game, the back and forth, it was really difficult for our middles to maintain the rage. And, you know, given our we had to make two changes so early in the game, we had to be mindful of our rotations from that point on. So we had to push guys out a little bit longer than than what we uh, ideally would have. And then the other part to it was I just thought we we lost our way a little bit with our, our, our end of sets. We started to um, allow uh, the Blues to, to, to dictate and dominate the transitional part of the game. And they were starting their sets often in really good field position in that in that period. So it was certainly something we addressed at half time. And I think you look at the kicking game of our, our, our guys in the second half, it was something we addressed and I thought we I thought we kicked them to death, pardon the pun, in the, in, the, in that second half. We just kept turning them around, backing it up with a wonderful chase game and I and I, I thought, you know, it was a key message for us at half time to go out and, and rectify our inner sets and we did. Well, let's talk about half time. Can you tell me what the feeling was like in the sheds, and and what were the messages you were emphasising? Uh, as I say, you know, the, the try and half time obviously crucial. So there was a good feeling uh, in the sheds. You know, there's a lot of positivity. We, you know, we needed to make sure that the guys calmed down and rested and relaxed because they they put so much into that first half. So we we had to make sure we we're really clear and calm with our messaging, so the players remained clear and calm and. Um, some of the messages were, were quite simple. We, we we really were aware that they were just really trying to overwhelm our middle of the field, you know. So we need to make sure that there was an awareness around that. That defensively we were, we were um, needed to be a little bit tighter in the middle of our our, our defensive uh, line. So spoke about that, and as I said, spoke just a, a, about our set finishes. You know, we needed to make sure that a um, we were playing plenty of footy to to advance the football as far downfield as we could. Then on the back of that, you know, a real emphasis around set finish, kicking in the corners, making it as hard as we possibly could for New South Wales to play the style of football they like to play. And the deeper we could get them coming out of their end, the harder we knew that was going to be to to play that style they like to play, where they very much love to overwhelm you through the middle field with their speed and uh, size around the uh, around the ruck. So I thought we did a fantastic job of taking those messages and, and, and putting it into practice in that second half. You mentioned the kicking game, and it seemed throughout the game a big point of emphasis from Queensland was to kick early and often. Was that spoken about much pre-game? Because it seemed like it was on even from, I think, the first set Queensland had. I think Ben Hunt might have kicked out a dummy half from tackle four. Yeah, not, it wasn't something we overemphasised, but you... you you look at those guys at club level, Ben Hunt does that for St. George a hell of a lot. Uh, he'll step up and kick early, particularly when they're around that 40-metre line on tack, play three or play four. So I think for him, just naturally, that carried over into the Origin Arena. And um, he's got a real good feel for that, Benny Hunt, about when's the right time to do that. And daily, uh, Cherry Evans is no different. So they're both great exponents of the 40-20 and... and uh, they have a great under, understanding of, of when to kick early and when to when to actually get through the complete set. So uh, it wasn't something, as I say, we had to emphasise or that we, we pushed particularly, but I, I thought those two guys had a really good feel in that second half about when to just get get rid of the ball early and when to play out a set and and, um, and, and, and put a kick in at the end, of the end of the set. The person I can remember doing it most in their career was Cameron Smith, the kicking early tactic. And... Do you think that because of the introduction of the six to go rule, we've sort of seen the kicking early tactic taken out of the game a little bit, but when, when the, when the ref isn't blowing many six to go penalties, it's sort of a natural adjustment to, to, to really start to kick early. Yeah, there's possibly, uh, you're possibly right there. I think obviously with the six games, you know, they can naturally advance you downfield, um, organically. Um, and, but also I think with the early kick, you look at, the better teams in the competition, like Nathan Cleary is a, um, a great exponent of it for Penrith at club level. They love to, to kick early and, and turn the screws. And, 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 and I think it I think it really demonstrates where your head's at as a football team when you're prepared to kick early and chase hard and, and, and turn the opposition team around and make them come out of their end. Um, I think it speaks to a, a real mindset. So it's, it's, it's something I, I love in, in our game. I think... 
Um, for mine, it's it, it, as I say, it's a real demonstration of of your, your your mindset going into the game and your your ability to to, to grind out a game. So um, for us, when those guys were doing that in the second half, I think it was a real message to the Blues. We're not here to, you know, we're prepared to go the distance here tonight, boys, and you guys are going to have to come out of your end if you want to win the game of football. So it was a really strong message. Josh, if you're picking an Australian team, how could you not pick the Hunt-Grant combo? Yeah, I think um, I think they're a really strong chance of, 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 of um, going down that path. I think, you know, you look at the modern game, I think you look at... Um, the nations they're going to be up against and the strength of those football teams. I think New Zealand are going to be a really strong football side, big big pack of forwards. So I don't think you'd be wanting to go into that contest uh, with one hooker. And I think you'd you'd want to use a hooker rotation, if you like, to, to continually have speed and sharpness out of the ruck to challenge the size of those teams. Tonga's no different. Um, so it... I think if if you're going to go down that path, which I would, I think those two guys and the way they work in tandem together would be the way that I go. I'm obviously biased, but I, I certainly see them as, as being, I think, a really good option for Australia come the end of the year. Can you talk to me about Ben Hunt? This is a guy who's received some really unwarranted criticism at times throughout his career. But Josh, if you're picking a team to play for your life at the moment, he's getting a jersey somewhere. Yeah, he, he is. And, I, you know, I'm... I haven't had a lot to do with Ben um, over the years. You know, we've crossed paths at different times, but certainly this camp and this series and working with him for the past six to seven weeks, I, he's just, he's a really likeable bloke. He, he brings a lot of energy to the group. He's hes, he's a guy that uh, lightens the mood a little bit um, when the mood needs to be lightened, but he's a, He's a guy that I can tell you from experience now that's immensely respected by his his peers and those that play with him. And um, because when it comes to the crunch, everyone knows that Ben Hunt goes to the fight. He he won't die wondering. He won't ever quit on his teammates, no matter how um, gassed he might be. How you know he could be wounded. You know he's just a guy that's so reliable and 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 he he, he actually wants those big moments. He wants He'll roll the dice. He'll 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 take a calculated risk in in those in those key moments, and and that's what the great players do. And and um, everyone's just really happy for him because yeah, it, he's had his ups and downs for sure over his over his journey. But the other night, you know, the the game, but also the way to cap it off with that try that'll that'll live on forever in, in Origin folklore, and and people will, that'll now be his moment. Um, they won't refer to the things that have gone on in the past, Ben Hunt, that's his moment now and that's his moment forever. You mentioned the try there. Josh, if he bobbles that ball even the slightest amount, it touches Nathan Cleary and New South Wales have a set 40 metres out with plenty of time to get a full set in. That, that That's one of the most remarkable, not only origin moments, but moments in history of the game. Yeah, yeah. And I just touched on that. Like he, it was, it was a, um, a, a spur of the moment decision, right? In that moment, you, you either just put pressure on the kicker and 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 you, your job's done, and you let him get his kick away, or you or you try and escort um, the chip and chase, or or you, you you do what Ben did and you you roll the dice and you 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 charge, you try and charge down and get the ball back for your team. So, as we know in rugby league, that could have turned out differently. But I think with a guy like Ben. When his intentions are so genuine, and everything he does is for the team and for the for the betterment of the team, I think often when when your intentions are sincere and 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 come from the right place, things tend to go your way, and the bounce of the ball tends to go your way. Uh, he earned that ball going in his hands the other night because um, he was doing it for the right reasons. It wasn't selfish. He was trying to help his team in a in a, in a nervy situation. And, and as I say, footy has a funny way of, of rewarding those that deserve it. I have to mention the other player that had just an extraordinary game for Queensland the other night, and that's Caelan Ponga. What, what impact do you think Billy has had on Caelan throughout this series? Yeah, I just think, uh, and, I, and I, I totally agree, I thought Caelan was immense for us. I thought it was a coming-of-age performance for him. And, um, 
yeah, he, he, he went to a new level the other night in my eyes and I think everyone's eyes. And I think for him, Billy, um, and this is no disrespect to, to any of the coaching or coaches that, that Kalen's worked under, but I think in Billy, Kalen sees um, a guy who's not only a coach, but almost a a, a, a pioneer in, in, in modern day fullback play. And I think that has given Kalen a lot of confidence and belief in his own game to just the conversations him and Bill have had throughout the, the Origin series. I think Kalen just felt like he's he's been learning from the best and he's he's been all ears and he's just been so invested and engaged in in everything that Bill's had to say. And and I, and I just think that that little one on one relationship that they've been able to build over the course of the series has absolutely rubbed off on on Kalen and his game and and um, he'll. He'll no doubt go back to Newcastle, a better player and, and um, a more confident player and, um, and, a, and a more well-rounded player. And um, yeah, he's just, it was it was really nice, I think, for Carlin to have that, that game the other night. He can be a little bit maligned himself at different times, but I thought the other night he stood up and showed his true class. Josh, Queensland didn't have a single bad player on Wednesday night, in my opinion, and I'd argue a big reason why Queensland had the success they did was in the selection of the squads in comparison. When you're thinking about who to pick, in your own words, can you tell me what makes an origin player? Oh, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think I can only speak for what um, we value um, as Queenslanders in terms of our players. And I think, you know, and this might sound funny because um, it has nothing to do with talent, um, but we... We value humil- humility, uh, dependability, um, resilience, never say die attitude. Um, I just think they're values and qualities that we hold really, really dear to to to, to what it means to to be a Queenslander and wear the jersey and represent the state. And um, you know, talent. Everyone, not everyone, but a lot of the the guys, and particularly when. They get to that level where they're knocking on the origin door. They've all got talent, but as I say, it's those qualities that, for us, separate um, a good, talented player from a from an origin player. And and I think those qualities were were on display the other night, and we needed all those qualities and those values to get us home. And um, you know, we're really proud of, I guess, the group for for, for showing those those types of qualities. And and we know they're all talented young men, but I think it is those qualities that separate them from the pack and and make them Queensland origin players. There are players whose stocks have risen tremendously throughout the series. You and I have spoken before about Pat Carrigan and how unreal he was. And whose stock rose the most in your mind? Yeah, it's hard to go past Pat. Uh, Obviously, I think, um, you know, we spoke after game one. His game one game was a game for the ages, you know, and and a coming of age night for that young guy. and I think the fact that games two and three he hasn't taken a backward step. He's just he's continued to maintain that that level of consistency. He certainly um, announced himself as uh, one of the best forwards in the game. Now I think prior to the series he was seen as a good player, um, but I think you know here we are after game three. I think you're looking at Pat Carrigan as one of the best forwards in the game now. So. You know, certainly he he he's one that jumps out. I think Lindsay Collins is. I know he got knocked out early in the piece um, in game three, but he's he's a guy to me that been ultra impressed with. Um, again, I knew Lindsay was a, was a good front rower, but I, he's only a young guy in terms of experience, and he's he's going to be a forward leader for the Queensland Maroons for, for many a year to come. He, he's tough. He he's what we love in our Queensland players, and. And um, he's probably a bit of an unsung hero because I think I think he's done a lot of the grunt work across the series. And, and it, although he got knocked out early in Game Three, he was he was he went out ready to play a big game, and he was he was very good for us in the minutes he played throughout the series. It's an exciting time for Queensland as far as forward depth goes. I can't remember a time in the last ten years when we've had this sort of forward depth. When you think of people like Reuben Cotter and Christian Welch, who would you who you would think are automatic selections into this team going forward? It's an exciting time, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and I, and I think um, you know the other guy I'd probably add to that mix is Tom Flegler. Like uh, Tom was sort of in the nineteen the entire series, very close to getting an opportunity in Game Three. Um, I, 
I've got a huge opinion of him. Um, and it is funny, Origin, and uh, particularly for us at Queensland, we don't have the depth of New South Wales. And you look at New South Wales and the depth of player and talent they have, that you know, it always looks like, you know, there's, you know, 30 odd, you know, players that they can pick from. Whereas for us, we can, we can go from looking like a little bit thin in the stocks one year to next year. It just turns so quickly. And, and this four depth has seemingly come from nowhere, but um, here we are. And yeah, I think we're all sitting back looking at the young forwards that we have and it does all go well for the future because there's some there's some there's some unbelievable young forwards now in our ranks, and it's going to hold us in good stead for years to come. Even though Pat Carrigan got the Wally Lewis medal, Josh, which I thought was totally deserved, it wouldn't have been out of place going to James Tedesco either. If there's if there's one blue who couldn't have done any more on Wednesday night, it was him, wasn't it? Yeah, I've got to say, and you know, as as, as um, you know, a coach of the opposition team, um, you know, you look at the Blues and you look at their team and um, they're an immensely good football side. There's so much talent in that football team, but the, I guess and this is how good Teddy is, as good as that team is, um, he's head and shoulders above anyone in that football side and I really mean that. He, I, I find what he does, I, I just can't help but respect and um, admire the way he plays the game. There's a, there's a relentless nature about his football that um, from the first minute to the 80th, he is at you the entire time. And um, I, I just, as I say, I, I know he plays for the opposition, but there's probably not a player in the game that I admire more than, than James Tedesco. I just, I love what he does. Um, there's no crap in him. He just gets out there and, he, and he, he doesn't stop playing for his team and he doesn't stop trying to do things to, to, to get his team over the line. And um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a wonderful player. And, um, you know, he's, he's yeah, he's, he's, he's a, and I think he's a great lesson for Kalen in that um, that relentless nature and the way that James attacks the game. I think I think for the first time I've seen Kalen, he did that the other night himself. And certainly James Tedesco is setting a high benchmark for the other full backs in the, in the competition to follow. Josh, why did Queensland win this series? Um, yeah, it's a good question. It's there's a lot that goes into it. Um, you know, I'd like to say, you know, you, you need a little bit of luck along the way. But when I think back on the series, I can't say that we had a whole heap of luck. You think about the disruption to our, our preparation for Game Three. Um, you think about the injuries in Game One. Um, you know, so we didn't get a whole lot of luck, and it, it, it adds more weight to the. To the to the quality of, of us winning the series, I, I think Billy got the the coaching set up spot on. I think he was really clear, Bill, about who he wanted on staff and and why he wanted uh, the people he had in, and, and we all had a role to play. And I think he got the balance spot on, and I, and I just think the staff gave the playing group a lot of confidence and a lot of belief that um, the right people were in charge, and, and that 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 confidence um, and I guess the aura of certainly, you know, Billy, Cam and Jono, I think that that aura rubbed off on our guys. And there was from day one to, to the final whistle, whistle went, sorry, in game three, our guys had an immense belief in, in uh, themselves and uh, what it meant to play for Queensland and an immense belief that they could, they could get the job done because, you know, when Cam and Bill and John spoke, what they spoke about, they've lived. And they've done it at the origin level more so than any three players to ever play the game. So when you have that that leadership model and those those guys talking about origin and what it takes to build pressure, what it takes to absorb pressure, what it takes to get through the tough times, you know, the players can't help but look at and hear that and go, well, these three guys know better than anyone. And I just think that, there was a there was a great level of belief instilled into the group from day one, and they still had to go out there and do it. But I think along the journey, their belief grew and grew. And when when tough times um, sort of beset upon us in that third game, that that belief kicked in. And and um, I just thought it was critical from day one that yeah the the, the group 
the coaching group were able to instill a, a wonderful level of belief in those young guys. And, and they went out and they delivered a, a Queensland performance for the ages. I always try not to be a prisoner of the moment when it comes to claims like this. And I've rewatched the game a few times now. And I, I, I truly believe it was the best game of rugby league I've ever seen. Now that you've had a couple of days to reflect on it, how high does it rate for you? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. And, and it is easy to get caught up in the moment um, when when you the moment is still so fresh. I think, you know, in my time, I've met, for me, that what set it apart was the brutality. I've There's been some epic origin games, and I thought game one was an unbelievable game of football. But... For me, what set this game, what set it apart from others, was the brutality. In this day and age, um, where the where the league has watered down the product a little bit to make it safer and and understandably so, and it's hard now for our game to to be so brutal. Um, it's it's officiated in a way that doesn't allow that brutality anymore. And for me, that's what sort of set apart. I can't think of a game. Uh, in my time, that had that combination of uh, brutality, um, tension, um, high skill, uh, huge moments, uh, drama. You know, it had absolutely everything. And it was a wonderful spectacle. And it, it's a reminder, I think, to the lawmakers of our game that we need to be really careful about how much we water our game down. Because when, when you get that combination of aggression and football, it creates this beautiful beast. Like it was, a, it was a spectacle to behold there the other night. So we need to be really careful as a game that we we don't water it down so much that we don't get more of those contests. My last question, Josh. I I know that um I know that it was it would have been a big high for yourself personally. Um, is it something you'd like to do do again going into the future? Because I was thinking about this the other day. As as you know, chaotic as it would be for a player, I would imagine it's almost if not more stressful for a coach in your position where you've got the club duties as well as origin duties? Yeah, there's no doubt it's a taxing period. Like I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'll hit a flat spot uh, emotionally, you know, the next probably seven days uh, when I get home. I've probably been home for four days out of the last seven weeks. Um, you know, two young kids. Um, you know, my partner's carried a massive load uh, over that time and, um, it's a draining experience. Like I compare it to club level, club level week in week out, it's a grind, and it's it's your preparation is largely around the physical side of of the game. Whereas Origin, the emotional toll is as great as the physical toll, and um, it, it it is a really uh, taxing time. It, it, it it's taxing emotionally. It, um, you invest so much of yourself into it, you get so emotionally, uh, I guess, attached to the the aura of, of Queensland and the history and um, and, the, and the people and doing it for your state. It, it, there's, there's such build up that when the series is finally over, it, it's just like this. You, you literally hit an emotional wall. And thankfully, uh, we were able to finish out on top because I, there's no doubt losing a series of, of that nature, um, the emotional toll would be probably even greater um, because you don't have that. That that finish that that fairy tale finish that 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 you'd like. So thankfully we're able to, to to win the series. But certainly it does take a huge toll, mate. And um, it'll take me some time to, to I guess get over that taxing nature of the series. But not not something I regret at all. I definitely want to continue to be involved. It, it was such a rewarding experience. Um, but yeah, it, it it is absolutely a a, um, a demanding um, period of the season when you're trying to juggle both. Well, Josh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the 60 Go podcast today. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. You've been really generous all series. Well done on the win, and good luck for Cronulla for the rest of the season. No, thanks for your time. Always enjoyable. A big thanks to Josh for coming on the show today. He's been incredibly generous with his time for this show throughout the series, and I'm very appreciative. By the way, if you want to get in contact with me, you can on Twitter at tcanfell, and don't forget to give that 60 Go Facebook page a like as well. My name is Tom Campbell. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe. And until next time, this has been the 60 Go Podcast and that is full time.